Feel free to have a seat. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Horizon Church, and we are overjoyed that you're worshiping this Sunday with us. Thank you for being here. Uh, And we are uh, towards the end of a series working through the book of Genesis, um, and I've uh, had a great joy in uh, in going through this this series. It's the first book of the Bible. Um, There's so many great stories. There's so many relatable things to life today. Um, And before we get started and get into the main parts of our message, uh, I wanted to share a story uh, from my own life. This is happened several years ago. Um, It was kind of in my early ministry career. Uh, I was serving on a a committee of sorts, uh, and we were looking at churches uh, in the region uh, when we were living in Nashville. And part of our job as this uh, this group was to kind of look at the vitality, the finances, the structures of of some of the churches in the area. Um, We were living in uh, kind of the urban core of Nashville. There was a large cluster of churches um, many of folks of uh, the neighborhoods had changed through the years. Uh, some of them, hundreds of years, had been there, um, and the neighborhood started to look a little different. And how do we best be the church to serve these these communities at this point in time? How do we allocate resources and actually send the right pastors to, to these communities? Um, and it was in this process that it, there was a lot of difficult conversations that were taking place. Uh, I mean, we were dealing with with folks that were really wrapped up in, in, their, in their neighborhoods, but also their churches. They had worshiped in these places, and some of them had been, been baptized or are married in these, in, these, in these physical buildings. And how do we best move forward to reach people for the sake of the mission? And it was a lot of hard conversations. Uh, and one of these conversations put me in, a con- in contact with a friend of mine. Uh, he was a, a pastor of one of these churches, and his church was struggling and, and on the decline. And it had been that way for several years, and he had been the pastor there. And uh, he was one of the first pastors that I got to know when, we, we moved, when Eric and I moved to Tennessee. Uh, she had actually preached for him uh, one Sunday that he was uh, on vacation. Uh, and we'll just call him James. And, and James got wind that we were kind of going to evaluate his church, and he got really angry one day with me that I was on this team that was looking at this. And, you know, he made some accusations at me that, you know, I wasn't really caring about people. I'd lost focus of what it meant to be a shepherd, um, that I was just focused on numbers and wasn't worried about the mission of the church anymore. And these things really hurt. Uh, you know, I, I, James was one of those first pastors that I knew. It was one of those first pastors that I got to know in the area. And to say the least, it really, it really started to hurt my heart. Um, and probably for a whole another year or two after this, I just like, my stomach would just completely turn to knots just at the mention of his name. Like in a meeting or if someone in passing had said they had seen him, my, my whole stomach would just like, and it would derail my whole day. It really began to take the joy of ministry out because of the things that he had said to me. And I realized that I began to hold a grudge against James. And later on, I was preparing for a message on about unity in the body of Christ. And it was in that preparation for the sermon that I began to, to really uncover that I had a lot of unforgiveness in my life towards James and the things that he, was, he had said to me that day. And I carried that one, you know, 15 second conversation with me each day. And I let it compound each day. And 15 seconds became a minute, an hour of my day where I was just ruminating on being so frustrated with what he had said to me that day and how those words had hurt me. And I think if we look back over our own lives, you might have an example where there are a grudge that you are carrying with you today. And we are going to look at a story that's probably the most powerful story of forgiveness in all of the Bible. And it's in Genesis 45, and it's the story of Joseph. And so, just a little bit of background, because we are skipping a a few chapters ahead from where we left off last week. Uh, Last week, we talked about Isaac and Rebekah. And so, Isaac and Rebekah, they they are the grandparents to Joseph. And so, Isaac and Rebekah have a son named Jacob, and Jacob then has 12 sons. And Joseph is kind of the most famous of those 12 sons. You might remember if um, you've ever heard these stories growing up as a kid, Joseph's got the fancy coat of many colors, right? He was, he was Jacob's favorite son, and he kind of doted on him, and he gave him this, this coat, and it got the other brothers 
a little angry. Um, and so they start plotting together, and uh, they come up with this scheme where they're going to throw him into a pit. And so he's now down in the pit, uh, Joseph is. And, uh, you know, the plan at that point was really to leave him to die there. And then they're like, one brother, I, f- I forget the name of which one it is now off the top of my head. One of the brothers is like, maybe that's not the best decision. Let's just at least get something out of this before we leave him in the pit. Let's sell him into uh, the slavery. There's some traders going by, and we'll send him into, into Egypt. At least we won't kill him that way. <laughs> um, and so they, they change their plans. They get him out of the pit. And they send him in to slavery down in Egypt. And his luck doesn't go much better for Joseph at this point. He's got kind of a, a rough journey. Um, eventually he works his way up uh, into Pharaoh's household. And he, he gets a job as one of the top officials in Pharaoh's household in the palace. And that's where the story meets us today. Joseph is one of those top officials. And he has this encounter with his brothers that had had this grudge against him and after all those years you would have expected him to have a grudge against his brothers as well so let's play let's pay special attention to his brothers the brothers fear and then joseph's response in light of that fear today so we'll be reading uh, uh genesis chapter 45 here starting the first verse then joseph could no longer control himself before all the attendants and he cried out Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Joseph, they had no idea this was Joseph. This, This person, they had gone down into Egypt at this point, looking for food. There was a famine in the land, and they had heard that there was food in Egypt. And they go there looking for food, and they encounter this man. They have no idea that it's Joseph, their, their, their long-lost brother they had sold into slavery. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me, sent me here, but God... He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have, I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourself, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, his brother t- brothers talked with him. This is a powerful scene. The brothers were, were fearful. They, they never imagined that, that Joseph would embrace them in this way. And Joseph tells them, what you had meant for evil, what you had, the ways that you meant to harm me by throwing me in a pit and selling me and sending me down to Egypt... In spite of all that, God is still more powerful. God was going to use the brokenness of this situation to bring good in this moment. When you are hungry, you are going to be fed here because that is the forgiveness that God offers us. And so we're going to look at at three things that forgiveness does today. 
The first thing is forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not just something we feel, but it's an active choice that we have to make. Joseph chose to forgive his brothers despite the pain in the past. We are now just, I think, uh, less than a week away from the Olympics. I know some of you have been following the trials, have seen what Olympians would make the team that the U.S. is about to send uh, to Paris. And I want to tell you a story that you might uh, know. It's a, a story of a, an Olympian from the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Um, there's a guy named Louis uh, Zamperini. And, and, and Louis... Uh, ran the, the 5,000 meters at that Olympic, uh, and he finished eighth. Uh, and I think one of my favorite things about the story of Lewis is uh, he was a, a, a kid of the Depression era. And so he, you know, didn't grow up with much. Um, and there was a, you know, a long journey from the U.S. to Berlin. I think they left from New York City uh, and traveled by boat. You know, Team USA went all together on a, like a cruise ship of sorts uh, to, to get to Europe. And one of the favorite things that I read about him was that he actually, on this journey, gained 12 pounds on the boat. <laughs> it may not have been the most advantageous, and maybe he would have been like sixth or seventh as opposed to eighth in the, in the 500 meters race. Uh, he gained 12 pounds on the boat because it was the first time that, you know, he'd ever had like three meals a day, uh, and it was all free, and he was like, this is the best thing ever, and I can totally relate as a kid that loves a good buffet, like, I would have been there too, like... Spending a week or two on a, on a cruise ship going across the Atlantic, I would have found the buffet. Um, and so he, he, he runs the race and the, runs the 500 meters. He finishes eighth. Uh, but what's, I think, super impressive is he actually ran his last lap. He ran it in 56 seconds. It was the fastest lap of anyone in that race. And he finished so fast that... Um, that he actually drew a lot of attention for how quickly, because most people don't run their fastest lap on the last one. Like, that's when you're tired and you're winded, and he actually finished and pushed through stronger. And that's, I think, emblematic of, of Lewis's life throughout the rest of his journey. And so after being this Olympic hero, uh, he runs in college at USC. Um, and then World War II breaks out in 1941, and he serves in the Pacific Theater and he's captured, and he ends up as a POW in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And it's there that he's, he experiences just indescribable trauma and physical abuse there and as a POW. And we now have a lot of a, a better language to explain what he experienced after the war, but he comes home after the war and he has PTSD and he has nightmares, and he has just severe anger for what had happened to him. He had this promising life, a successful athlete, an Olympian, and it feels like all of that has been taken away from him. And he wakes up every night with, with nightmares and just filled with anger. And at the urging of his wife, Lewis attends a Billy Graham crusade, in the Los Angeles area. And it's there at a Billy Graham crusade, he, he hears of Christ, and he gives his life over, and he begins this process of learning forgiveness in his own life because he had discovered the one that had forgiven him. And Lewis goes on to live this life that learns forgiveness and practices it each day. He actually eventually meets with some of those that had held him captive, had it, the people that had inflicted abuse on them, and he shares that he has forgiven them. And those powerful moments lead others that he had met with, those persons that he were his captors, to turn their life to Christ, because they had such a powerful experience that someone they had inflicted so much pain on is sharing that they would forgive them for what they had done. And Lewis goes on to live his life speaking about these experiences. And you might be uh, familiar if you've read the book or you've seen the movie Unbroken that tells the story of Lewis's life. Uh, if you haven't, uh, it's on Netflix. You can check it out this week. Uh, it's a little, it'll be a great prelude to the Olympics uh, and some of those, those awesome stories that come out of the Olympics. 
He's a powerful demonstration about how we don't have to let our past define how we practice forgiveness. It doesn't have to be a feeling. It's an active choice that we make. What grudges might you be holding on to today? The second thing that we learn from the story of Joseph about forgiveness is forgiveness teaches us about the bigger picture, that there's a bigger picture involved. When Joseph's brother, when, bro- when his brothers in that moment are, are, are fearful, and like in shock of what might happen to them because of what they've done, Joseph reminds them that there is a bigger picture involved. Again, when they weren't meant to do something f- to harm him, God was still going to use that for amazing things. When there was a famine in the land, you know where there was going to be food? It was going to be food for them in Egypt. And you know who was going to have access to give them food? Joseph. In spite of the pain that they caused him, God was still opening doors for forgiveness to take place. There's a parable uh, from India of of a water bearer that had two two buckets of water and the water bearer would would carry it on a pole on each side and would go to the well kind of like that story we talked about last week with with Rebecca at the well drawing water the water bearer would carry the buckets to the well would draw up water fill the buckets but here's the thing one of the buckets was a little leakier than the other the other one was pristine but one of the buckets had some holes in it And as the water bearer would would carry the buckets of water back, it would slosh a little on the way. The one that was leaking would splash out, and by the time the water bearer got home, the other bucket wouldn't be quite as full because it had dripped out along the way back home. And the the parable goes that over the years that this, this bucket came quite angry and ashamed that it never got home with a full bucket of water. Every day this thing, same thing happened. The other bucket got all the glory because it was a full bucket of water and I'm only half a bucket because I leak out. But what the water bearer points out to the bucket when it's filled with all this anger is it shows them the bigger picture that every day as they went along the road and water was dripping out of the bucket it was watering the flowers along the road. And its leakiness, its brokenness, its ashamedness was dripping out water for the flowers that were growing along the road. Something that the full bucket never experienced because it got home every day with a full bucket of water. When we can see the bigger picture of what God's doing, when forgiveness is able to help us take a step back And not be defined by that gut-wrenching, ruminating sense that I had with James that would just control my day. When I'm able to forgive him, I can see the other things that work in my life, like flowers growing up that I never had seen, that I was walking right past because I was so worried about being half full. And then finally, forgiveness opens the door to restoration. Forgiveness opens the door to restoration. And we see at the end of this story, there's an embrace. There's a family that's now reconciled here. It wouldn't have been possible without forgiveness. I'm going to tell you a little story today that's a a modern twist on what might be a familiar story. There's a guy named Tom, and Tom, early in his career, starts a business, and he builds this thing from the ground up. He works hard each and every day, and eventually he's got a thriving business, and he hires this young guy right out of college named Jack. And Jack, you know, is just eager and ambitious and excited to be there to work at this great company that Tom's built. And Jack starts to grow the business, even himself. And Jack's really almost like a son to Tom. He treats him like a son, and they start to even have conversations about Jack taking over the business one day. That's how close they were. Tom's now nearing retirement. 
And he comes across something one night when he's looking at the numbers one more time. And he begins to realize that Jack has embezzled money from the company that, that he had built that he was going to hand off to Jack. And Jack gets wind of this and he flees. He flees because he's embarrassed. He flees because he's ashamed. He's, he's flee, he flees because he's worried about getting caught and what might happen to him. And Tom's devastated. This is what he had built. And then one day, Jack comes back. And he knocks on the door of the business. And Tom is there waiting for him. And he greets him, and he gives him a hug. And what my, most of us might do is, would be call the police, tell them to get off my property. But J Jack is offered a job again. We might know that story from Luke, the story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son, right? The father embraces the son, even after he squandered everything, there's still reconciliation because he, he chose forgiveness. He saw the bigger picture and he wanted reconciliation to take place. Are we willing to take these steps today? What are the grudges that we're holding on to? How are we not choosing forgiveness? And it prevents us from seeing the bigger picture and opening that door up for reconciliation to happen. And here's the hard thing is, reconciliation isn't guaranteed when there's forgiveness. But it opens the door for that possibility. It opens the door for something to happen in the lives of people around us. And so this week, I've got a challenge for you. What is that one step, that one person that you can take is it acknowledging that you are just holding a grudge? Is it actually welcoming with open arms that person? Is it giving them a hug when you've wanted to run away, when that your stomach turned, when their name was even mentioned? It could even be a small step, like just praying for them. Because that's what, what Jesus asks us to do, right? We're supposed to pray for our enemies. And it is hard work, and it is not easy, but it is a step what is that step that God is calling you today to take this week? Because there is a one that even when we don't ask for forgiveness, that has already forgiven us. Jesus died for us, even while we were yet sinners, even when we, we have no understanding of the hurt that we have caused in the world. God has forgiven us. So would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you that you love us so much even when we don't recognize it. That you love us before we even take a step towards you. That your love surrounds us and says we are forgiven. God, let us not hold so tightly on to that grace. That we would extend it even when we feel like it's not deserved because you have first given it to us. God, we pray right now that we would be bold this week to take a step. Give us the courage to say, yes, I will forgive. Make that choice, God, so that our eyes can see what you are doing in our world, that it is so much bigger than our grudges. And God, we pray for reconciliation. We pray for reconciliation in our relationships that we pray also for the reconciliation that you promised to the whole world, that we would all be reconciled to you. We pray for that work, God, right now, that the whole world would, would experience your love and grace, that they would be freed, they would be fed, and they would flourish. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.